What you are about to listen to is an audiobook version of the Calamus Mythos chapters 19 and 20, which is part of the Calamus Mythos series, the latest installment in the overall Calamus Mythos universe. These two chapters are part of a story arc called Endless Crisis, which is meant to be the culminating final event that concludes over 15 years of continuity in the Calamus Mythos. If you're wondering what the Calamus Mythos is, I've done several videos explaining what it is. In short, it is a shared universe that includes my DC Comics fanfiction, Marvel fanfiction, uh, Hasbro Universe fanfiction, and all my original fiction and characters who all share one universe. I have been writing in this universe since I was in kindergarten, and Endless Crisis is meant to be the conclusion to over 15 years of continuity. The previous Calamus Mythos audiobooks that have been put on this channel so far were sort of meant to like whet your appetite, to give you an idea of sort of my writing style and how this all, how all these franchises essentially fit into one shared universe. This audiobook segment, this excerpt, is meant to help. This is the deep dive into the currently releasing Calamus Mythos story that's coming out right now. Uh, so you can see for yourself if you may or may not enjoy uh, reading the Calamus Mythos. So this is in the middle of the series, and this is in the middle of a massive arc that's meant to conclude the continuity. So this is heavily continuity heavy, but even though it's continuity heavy, I think you can kind of get an idea of whether or not you, you would like the series from these chapters. So without any further ado, let's start. The Calamos Mythos Chapter 19 The Scythe of Thanatos Gotham City, February 19th, 2019 It was chaos in the city. Gotham was burning in the night like it had never burned before. All districts, every neighborhood, and every shadow was the concentrated evils that the city had deep within its soul having come out to play. Though much of Gotham had been evacuated, there still was a large population of people hiding in their closets or forming survivor groups as the criminals and monsters ran the night. It was anarchy. One man had a monopoly on the destruction down in the Diamond District, Gotham's upper-class shopping area. A man in a green three-piece suit with a golden question mark for a hand and a green bowler hat stood in the center of the famous Diamond Crossing intersection. As he watched his similarly dressed goons smash up parts of the district, there was no traffic to worry about, and frankly there were very few civilians to terrorize out in the Diamond District at a time like this. The goal was destruction and the stealing of material wealth. Riddle me this, the Riddler smiled to himself as he rolled his R. When the government's away, where do those forgotten play? He gestured around himself. Everywhere, he laughed. And it helps that the bats solve doing whatever one does when you're in a space fleet. Will he ever come back? Will there even be a future? So many things you can slap a question mark on. You know what isn't a question? A voice suddenly spoke behind the Riddler. Whether or not there's an outcome in a fight between the Riddler and Red Hood and Red Robin that doesn't end with him wishing he never put on that stupid domino mask. The Riddler turned around to see the Red Hood and Red Robin standing before him, having somehow gotten close to Diamond Crossing without being noticed. Being trained by Batman would give one that ability. Ah, the sidekicks, Riddler smiled. What's wrong, bored because Daddy's not throwing you into suicidal situations so you have to throw yourselves into one? As Riddler spoke, several thugs surrounding Diamond Crossing pointed their weapons at Red Hood and Red Robin. I can draw my pistol and shoot Riddler in the forehead, and you can drop a smoke pellet, and we'll be out of here lickety-split. Red Hood whispered to Red Robin. No, Red Robin whispered back. We don't kill. You don't. Not having this discussion again, Red Robin frowned. He then called out to Riddler. Edward, you don't have to do this. We don't have to fight. So many things have already gone wrong, and you guys... Red Robin gestured to all the Riddler goons. What about you? Do you not have any family or friends you care about? Is this what you want to be doing at the end of the world? Who knows if any of the stuff you're looting right now will even have monetary value in a few days if the universe is destroyed? Riddle me this. When is life not living? The afterlife, 
Here's the thing, Pipsqueak. The universe already died. I noticed the time change. You heroes fought Thanos and failed, and now I'm in the afterlife. You think you're in the afterlife, Red Robin sighed. Great. You're not in the afterlife, but I can send you to it, Red Hood said, drawing his pistol. It's overrated, I would know. As Red Hood aimed the weapon, the surrounding goons became visibly more hostile. Drop it, freak! Put the gun down! Wow, Red Robin remarked. Yeah, they really don't want me to drop the Riddler, Red Hood observed. That's not it. In any other circumstance, they would kill you immediately. I think the goons are afraid of us for the first time. Not in the Batman, scare people with bat ears kind of scary, but in the fact that they know who we are and what we can do. Yeah, cool, whatever. Red Hood sighed. He started to pull the trigger. No! Red Robin cried, jumping and grabbing Red Hood's hand and pulling it down as he pulled the trigger. While the bullet did not land a kill shot in the Riddler's head, it did shoot through his right shin. Ah! Riddler cried. Son of a- Before Riddler could finish his cry, his voice was overtaken by the flurry of bullets his goons unleashed upon Red Hood and Red Robin. Red Robin quickly dropped a smoke pellet before the two grappled away to the roof of a nearby building, where they laid prone to avoid being spotted by the Riddler goons on the street. What was that? Red Hood and Red Robin yelled at each other at the same time, before their headsets activated in their helmet and cowl. Batman to Red Team, report your status. Jason almost shot Riddler in the head, Bruce, Red Robin complained. Tim stopped me from shooting Riddler in the head, Bruce. Red Hood quickly replied. A moment of silence passed. The two could just sense that Batman was rubbing the bridge of his nose in frustration at how the call has been going so far. How is the Riddler right now? In Diamond Crossing with a bullet in the shin, Red Robin replied. No, the bullet went through. It's not in there anymore, Red Hood corrected. Whatever, how are things in Gotham? Batman asked. Honestly... This might be the worst things have ever been here. Worse than the crime waves and the damage taken during the Genesis event. Red Robin sighed. Not a single piece of the city is safe. Wayne Manor security turrets are working overtime to keep looters away, but I fear we'll have to retreat into the cave and consider the manor and everything inside it as acceptable losses. Hmm, <sighs> Batman grunted as he listened to the report. Funny, that's what Asriel said too, Red Hood pointed out. Hold the manor for as long as you can without having to resort to lethal measures. Rubber bullets in the turrets, Batman ordered. Of course, Red Robin replied. What about you, boss? When are you coming back down to join us? Red Hood asked. Actually, the fleet is making preparations to go to Cybertron, Batman replied over the radio. Cybertron? The Transformer homeworld? Red Hood asked. He had experience working with Cybertronians before. Yes. And you're coming back down here before then, right? No way Batman is going to Cybertron, Red Hood asked. I've actually been elected as Admiral of the Pact Fleet, Batman said hesitantly. You've what? The two cried in unison. His name is Thanos, and this is the story of his beginning. One thousand years ago, he was rescued from death by death. The universe is one of suffering, and death was witness to it all. She didn't particularly find joy in suffering. Not in the conventional sense of joy. She took joy in doing her job and seeing firsthand that, without death, there would be no life and no enjoyment. Endless fun is no fun at all, but a status quo that cannot be differentiated from anything else. She had a job to fulfill, and because of that, she loved death. She loved destruction. It was in her nature to be that way. It was her duty as Death of the Endless, a family of beings that represented different phenomena in reality. The Endless have a role to play that requires their involvement in worldly affairs. However, they are not barred from doing things beyond their role should their own interest in time allow it. Death would spend time sightseeing the universe, though, at the same time, she would be reaping souls into the afterlife the moment these souls died. The Endless, if they so chose, could be in many places at once. Death particularly enjoyed visiting societies with a large amount of death. 
the planet Gnad in their weekly World War level blood sports, the corpse pyramids of Paparapapi and their constant stream of bodies to replace the ancient corpses that would disintegrate with age, and the Sharktacon pools of Quintessa were all some of Death's favorite spots in the universe. In the 11th century, she decided to spend more time on the moon known as Titan to explore the Eternals and their hidden eugenics projects to prevent deviants from festering within their society. How delicious it would be, she thought, if I were to raise the next born deviant and turn him loose against those who sought to kill him the moment he was born. And so she waited, keeping a close eye on Titan. In 1019, her chance came with the birth of an infant that, by now, we know too well. We know how that went. All the Eternals in the room dropped dead as Death apparated into the room, grabbing the baby. Cradling the baby in her arms, she looked from the baby to the dead bodies. She looked back at the newborn and saw in his black pupils a vision of what she had in store for him. Thanos, Death spoke. Your name is Thanos. From Thanatos, god of the non-violent death. The living embodiment of the inevitability of the end. She smiled sweetly at the child. You will be the bookend to this persisting universe. The universe used to operate in a cycle of big bangs and big crunches. A universe would be born, live out its life, and then die. From the cosmic egg, God would hatch the universe anew. Death enjoyed savoring the final moments of a universe before everything died. It was the grand dessert to a long feast, and with the birth of a new universe, she knew that the fun days were still ahead. But then, in the last cycle, something changed. The multiverse was born. With it, universes no longer existed sequentially, but parallel with each other. There was no longer a promise of an end, as every decision birthed the new universe. Even if a universe died in a big crunch, a new one would pop up before its end. The multiverse was infinite, and death hated that. There was only one way to bring it all to an end, screaming. The Endless were allowed to interact with the world on their own terms, but were not allowed to, say, end it on their own volition. But raising a being, a tool, to do that for them? That was something their creator allowed. The Sanctuary 2, Orbit of Jupiter, February 5th, 2019. Thanos sat in his chair on board his ship, the Sanctuary 2. He felt old and weak despite wielding the most powerful weapon in the universe on his hand. The last few days had been a fight after fight against the stubborn and persistent people of Earth. Thanos just wanted a moment to rest and heal. With loose movements, Thanos activated the ship's GPS, Galactic Positioning System, and inputted the coordinates of where he saw Cybertron from Sideswipe's memories. Soon, a holographic map displayed the metallic sphere with jutting pillars as it floated near a massive, concentrated asteroid belt that was once known as the planet Kunari. It was located within the same galactic quadrant as the solar system, a bit further to the galactic north. Interestingly enough, Cybertron was nowhere near the boundaries of the Autobot Commonwealth and Decepticon Empire. This was because Cybertron was thrown out of orbit from the Hadean system long ago by the war between the Cybertronians. Cybertron, Thanos sighed. Your core should have what I need. But what I need right now is rest, Thanos said to himself. Indeed, he could just go to Cybertron right now with the Space Stone, or revitalize himself with the Power Stone, but Thanos knew Death wanted a magic show, not real-life cheat codes. She set him on the quest to find the Infinity Stones to set up a spectacle she could savor, not a disappointing blink. Titan, 1048 1048 was the year that Thanos returned to Titan. He had been in the care of Death for years since his abduction. Every day, Death told Thanos of his story, and how he lived in a universe of suffering and pointless survival, despite not deserving survival given the measures beings went to secure it. The universe deserved to die, and he was going to give it what it deserved, starting with Titan. 
People were out and about on the surface of Titan when the young Thanos suddenly popped into existence, transported by death. He stood in full battle armor with a large, double-bladed, staff-like sword. The Eternals immediately looked at the Outsider in his own land with fear. Eternals, I am the ghost of your past, Thanos said calmly, though he gripped the handle to the blades tightly with hate in his heart. Impossible! A deviant! One Eternal cried, while another Eternal raised her hands, shooting lightning from her fingertips at Thanos. Thanos took the hit and growled in pain as he fell to his knees. I've got him, I've got him, she cried. Suddenly, Thanos looked up at the Eternal before throwing his staff sword like a javelin. The mighty blade found itself lodged in the lightning wielder's throat before she fell to the ground. Thanos charged in, pulling a dagger from a strap on his thigh, slaughtering his way through the colony. Two faces looked up at Thanos, their large eyes watering in fear. Thanos grimaced at what cowered before him. There were two blue, deviant twins hiding in the cellar of one of the houses on Titan. Thanos killed their mother. Obviously, this mother hid her children rather than kill them. Thanos stood lost in thought as he looked at the two children. What did he see when he looked at them? The way his family should have treated him if this had been a fair world? An example of the failures of the Eternals' eugenics? Two beings that represented how things were unfair to him? Living comedy? Perhaps all of the above. Regardless, their crying heads rolled. Thanos sat alone on Titan. The colony was a ghost town. The Eternals had been slaughtered. Thanos had lodged his blade into the ground as he sat on the front steps of a house, which had its owner draped out through one of the windows. Thanos took his helmet off as he looked up at Saturn in the sky with a sigh. He was happy, but he wasn't happy enough. He took on one flawed society, but many more were out there. He knew what death told him was true. The universe deserved to die, and he needed to be the one to kill it. Helipan, 1067. Thanos spun around as he fought three Heliponese warriors at once. The laser sword wielding humanoids with six fingers on each hand were usually a challenge for invading species, but Thanos was holding his own despite needing to keep his weapon away from the laser swords as they would cut his metal blade. It didn't take long before the warriors fell and Thanos was alone as he heard the city burn behind him. He grimaced. He wasn't finding this as fun as he used to. It used to be a rush when he ended a society. Now it was just one more check mark on a long, long list. He didn't have the time. As he thought as much, death suddenly appeared. Having fun? Death. Thanos acknowledged his caregiver. One more world has fallen to your realm. I've noticed, Death said, gesturing to the dead bodies around Thanos. You've been working fast. And yet too slow. I don't have enough time to achieve my goals and having children to succeed me would be counterproductive. Come here, Death said, beckoning to Thanos. Thanos nodded and approached Death, kneeling on one knee in a bow. Death smiled, reaching out with her finger and touching Thanos' forehead, and drawing a strange symbol with her finger. Thanos shuddered at the cold when she touched him. With this, I swear to not take your life by any natural causes, Thanos of Titan, she smiled. While I will not give you full immortality, because honestly, where's the fun in knowing you can't die? I will not take your life by old age, and you will never age. You are my experiment who will walk a dangerous path throughout the universe to see it to the end. Thanos looked up at death. I thank you, he smiled. Station 8823, 1119. You're 100 years old today, you know that? Death asked as she and Thanos stood alone in a ravaged space station that Thanos had destroyed, gutting every inhabitant on the platform. She had suddenly appeared after Thanos' path of destruction. I lost track, Thanos replied. 100 years have passed since I took you away from that terrible world titan and set you on the path to destroy the universe. I see, Thanos replied, tired. 
You know how many civilizations you've wiped out since then? Death asked. I lost track, Thanos repeated. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven civilizations no longer exist thanks to you in your first hundred years. You know how many civilizations have died of natural causes without your intervention? Thanos didn't reply. A whole lot more than 27, I can tell you that. Hell, there are Decepticon individuals who have killed more civilizations than you in a shorter time frame. What do you want from me? Thanos snapped. I am but one man with a sword. I'm sorry I'm not living up to your expectations. You need to think beyond the blade, Death pouted. I expected you to do a little bit more research on weapons and items of power. You think you can end the universe with a blade? What else is there? Thanos asked, wishing to reach Death's point. How about you start with looking for the Infinity Stones? Death smiled. The what? Stones of universal power birthed during the Big Bang? With these stones, more and more civilizations will fall to you, Death explained. Thanos was intrigued. As Guardian Space 2018. Thanos was 998 years old as he stood before the Asgardian Prince Loki, out in an asteroid in space as he handed him the Mind Stone within a special scepter. The Mind Infinity Stone had been the first of the stones discovered by Thanos, locked away behind a wall from some ancient civilization. As he passed the scepter to the vengeful Asgardian, Thanos smiled. The first piece of the game was on the board. It wouldn't be long until it all came together. With one stone came the others. The end to his long search was coming. He's here to relieve the universe of its pain, an agent of fairness. He's here to impress the woman who showed him the light of the dark. But make no mistake, he's not here to alleviate the resource scarcity in a finite universe. He's not here to destroy the universe only to bring it back in his own image. He's not here chasing an unrequited romance with a being he will never be equals with. He is here to destroy the universe. Because that is the way it must be. He is here to destroy everything as a parting gift to the one who gave him everything. No matter what happens, the universe was always destined to go out. He's here to make it go out in a blaze of inglory. He's here to make sure the universe dies screaming just as it made those who lived within it die screaming. It's what the universe deserved. It's what death deserved. His name is Thanos. And he is here to deliver an ending. The Calamos Mythos, Chapter 20, Primal Scream Cybertron, February 13th, 2019 Cup sat at his chair in the monitor room, looking at an electronic map of Cybertron on the screen. His eyes glanced from the purple blips on the map to the red blips, knowing that the red blips needed to be defended from the purple. On some parts of the planet, the red and purple blips were right up against each other as different windows provided reports on temperature, terrain, and other statistics like sustainability of casualty rates. Of course, the red represented his fellow Autobots. The purple represented the Decepticons. Optimus Prime and Megatron had only arrived for a brief period of time before they were already out on another adventure. Ultra Magnus had reassumed leadership of the Autobots on Cybertron, Megatron had installed a loyal general named Tidal Wave to serve as his proxy of leadership on Cybertron, instead of leaving it in the hands of Scorponok, who he didn't trust at all. Other readouts on the map included structural integrity, as Cybertron was an ever-shifting mass for the past few years, with pillars jutting out from the ground overnight and disappearing the next day. Other areas were experiencing rock showers thanks to small particles of the planet Kunari crashing down onto the surface of Cybertron. The destruction of Kunari was something that both the Autobots and the Decepticons were responsible for, to cup shame. After all, he had been the one who trained Prowl all those years ago. It was Prowl who activated the shields that destroyed Kunari. 
Suddenly, a strange point opened up in Cybertron space over some Autobot territory that caused Cup to sit up. Was it a transwarp signature? Earlier in the war, when they had the energy, the Decepticons used transwarp troopers to get behind enemy lines. The troopers would use transwarp to teleport behind the front lines and drop forces and pound enemy positions. Cup personally hadn't seen a transwarp trooper operation in thousands of years, and even then, the last time was more of a makeshift plan made in desperation than an actual application of Decepticon strategy. Cup leaned forward to read the data. Unlike transwarp technology, which bent the universe like a piece of paper before piercing a line between the two points on the folds, this spatial anomaly seemed to change the nature of space itself. The universe wasn't folded like paper, but had the laws of space itself altered, so that the two points were always the same, and always would be, until the point, presumably a portal, disappeared. Well, that's new, Cup muttered. Usually, a purple blip or some other color would pick up on the radar, but the map simply showed the portal open and close. Cup hit some buttons on the console, zooming in on the region and running a more dedicated scan. Nothing showed up. Hmm, maybe it was a glitch, Cup said to himself as he hit a button to show a visual on the region through the use of one of the many Autobot sky spies. The screen displayed a region of space and Cup squinted at the vast field of stars and darkness. Something caught his eyes. Zoom in on that position. Cup ordered the computer, pointing to a specific location on the screen. While the resolution was poor, Cup could make out a small, armored humanoid being. Some glowing colors near the blurry figure piqued Cup's curiosity. Energy scan, what are those? According to the database, the computer spoke, the target is in possession of objects with identical energy signatures to the following. As the computer spoke, the screens displayed everything the Autobots knew about the mind and time Infinity Stones. Oh, Cup said, his eyes widening. This was who Optimus Prime deployed to fight against. This was Thanos. Elsewhere on Cybertron, later. The Autobot officer Hot Rod stood on the cold surface of Cybertron with a large force of Throttlebots, the mass-produced soldiers of limited sentience used by the Autobot forces. A unit of Autobots known as the Protectobots, made up of Hotspot, Blades, Streetwise, First Aid, and Groove, were also present under Hot Rod's command. Hot Rod was a young officer in the Autobot Commonwealth, but had a lot of heart and high ambitions. He wanted to prove himself as a capable commander. Today was his chance. All right, boys, we have reports from Cup that Thanos is headed this way. Hot Rod spoke to his troops. According to Optimus Prime, he's going to try to make his way to the core, and we absolutely cannot allow that to happen. Let's light him up, Hot Rod smiled. The troops cheered before their voices were drowned out by a barrage of laser and rocket fire. As the Autobots ran every which way for cover, Hot Rod turned and looked at the night sky. The sky was nearly flooded by ships that looked identical to the Ark and the Nemesis. Thanos had created a fleet of copies of the Cybertronian ships he had encountered before, all through the powers of the Infinity Gauntlet. Hot Rod grimaced. This wasn't going to be a fight he could win. He quickly jumped behind a pillar and opened up his internal communications. Hot Rod to Ultra Magnus! Go for Magnus, Ultra Magnus replied over Hot Rod's communicator. Thanos made a whole lot of arcs and nemesises, nemesi, nemesis, whatever, Hot Rod cried. We need a significant amount of air reinforcements if you want to stop him. Hot Rod hated that he had to call for backup, but he had no other choice in this scenario. What do you mean he made a lot of arcs and... and Decepticon ships? Ultra Magnus asked after a slight pause. Wait, Hot Rod stopped. I didn't say Decepticon ships. I gave three different plurals for nemesis. Yes? Ultra Magnus asked, failing to see the point. I just embarrassed myself. You gotta say the correct plural form now. Hot Rod, this isn't the... You aren't saying it because you don't know which one is right either, do you? I can hear you judging me since I sounded phenomenally stupid, but you don't know either. Well, I know it's certainly not Nemesis, Ultra Magnus cried in response. The Calamos Mythos Earth Orbit Batman stood at the command bridge of the Calamus Mythos. 
The packed fleet was large, consisting of American, Russian, Chinese, and French vessels from Earth. The Justice League of America's Watchtower, the Blockade of Earth and the Lunar Blockade, the Ark, the Nemesis, elements from the Autobot fleet and the 14th Imperial Decepticon fleet, the Galactic Council, and ships all the way from Teutonia flying the Teutonus flag. The packed fleet was a force to be reckoned with. Never before had such a ragtag fleet been established. Nervously, Batman looked around him at the officers of many different military forces, politicians, news reporters, translators, and more who surrounded him in anticipation. On the screens in front of him were displays from the captains of various ships and leaders of various factions. He was about to give one of the most important orders that would change human history. He was going to abandon Earth to track down and defeat the source of much of its problems. He hoped his parents would be proud of him. Attention, all captains within the Pan-Galactic Reality Defense Pact Battle Fleet. This is Admiral Batman, Batman said before taking a pause. Finally, he spoke once more. On my command, prepare to warp. All ships had been outfitted with warp technology, and the coordinates for Cybertron had been programmed to each and every navigation computer. Batman looked at all those around him. He could be leading them to victory or leading them to their deaths. Launch. One American officer at the makeshift warp console of the Calamus Mythos, attached to poorly kept wires after all the installation of the warp drive had been done with a time constraint, pulled a lever on the console just like many other navigation and warp officers across the fleet. Batman watched the main screen as the field of stars and ships slowly warped away as the stars flew by in a dazzling illumination. Cybertron Space one by one, the packed fleet fell out of warp near Cybertron. Cup was startled at his monitoring station, fearing a potential second invasion, when he calmed down upon seeing the Ark and various other Autobot ships. In a few moments, the packed fleet was now in Cybertronian space. For some in the fleet, it was just a small step into space, the usual road home for the Cybertronians. For others, like the Americans, Russian, Chinese, and French, they had quite literally made the Quantum Leap. As Batman's eyes adjusted to the new sights on the main screen, he felt his heart sink. The space above Cybertron was an intense war zone, with Autobot ships left and right engaging what appeared to be another fleet of copies of the Ark and the Nemesis. Single fighters engaged in dogfights over an area that would cover a quarter of the planet if they were fighting on the ground. The multicolored explosions and burning ships were blinding at times. Well... Alexander Pretensis said, standing at the bridge of the Imperium. This all looks very... Battle of Coruscanti. He referenced a scene in Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Except, the ships are even more titanic. This is what we feared, isn't it? His wife, Ari, asked, glancing from the display to the Emperor. The full power of the Cybertronians. Do we engage? General Unit AX asked. Alexander looked over at a window on the screen that showed live footage of Batman standing in the Calamus Mythos. That's a good question, Admiral. Do we engage? Alexander asked. Batman was still getting used to the situation around him, but was creating a strategy at the same time. Yes. All Bavorian, Decepticon, Galactic Council, and Autobot ships are clear to engage Thanos' fleet, Batman ordered. These orders trickled through to Alexander, Megatron, the newly promoted Admiral Huawei, and Optimus Prime, who passed the orders to their officers, who passed the orders to their ships. Soon, the largest of the ships broke off from the packed fleet and charged the enemy, deploying smaller one-man fighters, flyers, and owls, the signature one-man fighters of the Bavorian Empire. Batman watched solemnly as a shot from one of the false nemesises, Nemesai? Shot through a Galactic Council ship, sending the ship on an uncontrollable crash course towards Cybertron. We won't win anything this way, Shadow Spartan sighed to Batman's left. Batman nodded. Jeffrey, Batman started. Aye, Captain. Jeffrey Swenson smiled in one of the windows on Batman's screen. Batman ignored the rank and address issue and continued. Get the Space Wizards to try to get a track on Thanos or the Infinity Stones, Batman ordered. Roger Dodger, Bats. Jeffrey saluted before walking off to fulfill his duty. The Justice League of America Watchtower Doctor Strange, also known as the new Doctor Fate, stood on the bridge of the Watchtower, watching the battle that was unveiling before his very eyes. 
Turrets on the sides of the watchtower had been activated and were actively firing at the enemy. Strange watched through the helm of fate as the Decepticon Starscream engaged a series of dogfighting maneuvers that enabled him to destroy one of the thrusters on an arc clone. Strange, Jeffrey suddenly spoke. Strange turned around and looked at Jeffrey as he approached him, making his way past a crowd of refugees. Manager Swinson, please, call me Dr. Fate, Strange said sadly. The loss of Kent Nelson was a significant blow to the fleet. Dr. Fate, I need you to try to get a lock on Thanos or the Infinity Stones, Jeffrey said. Maybe Kent could do that, but I don't know, Fate started. Don't give me that. Kent was a magnificent magician, but so was Dr. Strange. Don't let his death get to you, Jeffrey said, understanding the respect that was needed for Fate, but also understanding the value of Strange. Dr. Strange also had hands that could work, Dr. Fate refuted, raising his hands which were covered in casts, glowing with magic as Fate was slowly trying to repair the damage done by Thanos. Please, just try, Jeffrey pleaded. Dr. Fate continued to stare at Jeffrey through his helmet before sighing. All right, but this is going to hurt. He's currently going down a shaft towards the core. He got past the Autobot ground defenses. Jeffrey quickly relayed to Batman over the communications network. No, Batman cried, realizing the dangers of the situation. We need to get a team down to the core and cut Thanos off now. I'll do it, came the voice of Optimus Prime. Alone? That's suicide. Batman criticized the plan, looking over at the video feed from the command deck of the Ark. But Prime was no longer there. Instead, Jazz was sitting in the captain's chair, looking slightly uncomfortable. Oh, Jazz said as he realized Batman was looking at him. Uh, the boss bot's kinda... already left. Suicide is kinda his thing, Jazz admitted. Optimus Prime had simply jumped out of the arc, rocketing towards Cybertron in a straight line. His free fall only accelerated through the power of a jetpack he had grabbed from Sideswipe. While he was rocketing towards Cybertron, he was dodging cruisers, fighters, laser blasts, and debris every which way. He narrowly dodged a Nemesis missile, barrel rolled around a Galactic Counselor Dagger class fighter. Nearly crashed into Blitzwing, but he trusted his eyes more than his internal computer that was screaming at him to stop to let Blitzwing pass. Instead, Prime went faster so that he passed Blitzwing by the time his trajectory would have intersected with his. A false arc was all that stood before him in his mad rush towards Cybertron. Thankfully, Prime had brought a spare force field generator from Trailbreaker, though the thought of how the engineer would criticize Prime's intended use of the device in this situation went through his head as he slapped the generator onto his chest and activated it. The sphere enveloped his body as Prime accelerated the jetpack, crashing through the roof of the false arc. He then succeeded to crash through floor after floor within the arc until he finally broke through the final layer and through the arc itself. The destabilized ship exploded behind and above Prime as he began to feel the tug of the Cybertronian atmosphere. Prime adjusted his angle of attack as he approached the ground. Instead of going in a straight downward charge, he was now moving with the curvature of the planet, finally finding the hole Thanos supposedly went down to find the shaft towards Cybertron's core. The moment Prime entered the shaft, the jetpack and force field generator both ran out of power. That's fine, Prime thought. I'll let gravity do the rest was what went through his mind as he fell down the shaft headfirst into the unknown. I'm coming for you, Thanos! were the words Prime screamed as he descended. It was time for this to end. Cybertron's Core Oh, Thanos said to himself in mild surprise. It was eerily quiet within the core of Cybertron. Thanos was the only one in the room. The quiet was so intense that this was when he first realized that the Infinity Stones gave off a light hum. To say Thanos was alone wasn't entirely accurate. He stood before the face of the slumbering Primus. Well, that's interesting. To say Thanos was alone with Primus was also something that could be refuted from a certain point of view. There are those beings who go beyond the state of being confined to one location or in any location. Well, well, well. Look at what you found. Death smiled behind Thanos. While most would jump and get startled by the sudden appearance of death behind them, Thanos lived a life that ensured that he was one of the few who didn't. I haven't seen this guy in a long time. 
You know this... thing? Thanos asked. It was hard not to be astonished by finding a massive face within the core of a metal planet, even for a man with the power of a god. They call him Primus. He's a robot god, Death informed him. R robots have gods? Well, I guess they're not technically robots in the strictest of terms, but yes, they have gods. Never really liked him. You know, what with the whole making life stuff, Death said, pacing before the face of Primus. He's a creation god. Hmm, Thanos thought out loud. I'm not sure how I can best use him as a weapon. Well, he's certainly capable of more death if he just applied himself more. He went through this one phase where he ran around slaughtering his own creations with a sword that was pretty sweet, but besides that... When it comes to Cybertronian deities, his opposite is what I find more fascinating. Thanos turned and looked at Death, intrigued. His opposite? The Chaos Bringer. Unicron. One of the greatest threats the universe has ever faced. He wiped out so much of the early universe that I'd imagine we'd be in a much larger one if he hadn't popped up. But Primus and his creatures stopped him and discarded his body out into space. Death recounted the tale, seemingly in awe of Unicron. So he's dead. No, it's nearly impossible to kill someone like that. He's sleeping, just like his brother here. Death lazily gestured towards Primus's face. The two are connected, you know. Primus went to sleep so that Unicron wouldn't find him later. You want to awaken Unicron? Death smiled mischievously. Wake Primus up. Thanos remained stoic, listening to Death's words. Unleashing Unicron sounded like the greatest evil one could do besides wiping the universe out completely. But Thanos had experience in that regard. He looked from Death to Primus. He then glanced back at Death, whose smile still had not faded. He then turned his head once more to Primus and raised his fist, bearing the Infinity Gauntlet. Fine. God Robot. Show me the one they call the Chaos Bringer. Thanos fired a jolt from the Power Stone right at the forehead of Primus. Upon impact, the massive face stirred and the walls around the core began to tremble. Indeed, the whole planet began to shake on a scale never seen before. Primus's eyes opened, revealing glowing yellow lights in his eyes that nearly blinded Thanos. The god let out a mighty scream in pain that would have deafened Thanos if it wasn't for the Infinity Gauntlet defending him. Outside, ships continued to fight, but some looked out in concern at Cybertron as the whole planet physically shook. Then came the loud scream that could be heard across that quadrant of space. On the Calamus Mythos, Batman's eyes widened. On the Imperium, Alexander's heart dropped. Still falling down the shaft, Optimus Prime screamed in rage. On the Nemesis, Megatron frowned. In the packed fleet, Elizabeth Lackley, the former President Mee, the Assistant, and Albert Kirky were hiding in the security room where the refugees were being kept safe. Nearly all of them felt terror. Death smiled. The Dark Nebula Antilla Far away from Cybertron, deep in space, Star Saber was patrolling the Dark Nebula in his starfighter form. The Dark Nebula was a hot spot for the Dire Wraiths, creatures Star Saber was monitoring for the purpose of Autobot intelligence. What startled him this instant wasn't the Dire Wraiths, but the movement on a planet his records labeled as Antilla. Well, he didn't really need the records. He had spent nearly every waking hour memorizing the roots, the stars, the planets, and so on. By movements, he is concerned by the fact that the planet itself was shifting. It wasn't shifting the way Cybertron was, in a chaotic mess. Antilla was shifting as the tectonic plates dropped off and massive horns emerged, followed by a mechanical ring. Star Saber was horrified once the shell of Antilla was completely destroyed and the shifting was completed. He floated alone before the Uncreator. He floated alone before Unicron. And those are chapter 19 and 20 of the Calamus Mythos. If you find that you're interested in the Calamus Mythos and want to read more, you can go to the Calamus Mythos website, and the link is in the description. Uh, new releases are announced on the Discord servers in the Lazy Koala's Discord server and Commander Radix Discord server, as well on the Commander Radix Twitter account. So check out those for new updates, and yeah... 
If you're new to the channel entirely, which, what a weird introduction to the channel this video must be, consider subscribing to the channel for more nerdy content. Check out all my social media links in the description. Consider supporting me on Patreon if you want to see this channel continue, and have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Huge thanks to our patrons, including this month's $10 plus patron, Josh Adkins. Check out the description for more patrons and more info about how you can receive a shout out here.